It says this. To the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me against you. You only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation." And uphold, with, uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation. And my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. When a child does something wrong, the parent has a tendency to pull them aside and ask them a simple question. What's wrong with you? What were you thinking? We look at our children when they do something wrong as if it's strange. This is weird that you would act this way. If only you were thinking better, you would have done better. What is this foreign substance I've got here among me? This imperfect child. How is it that you could act this way? The renowned English writer and Christian apologist G.K. Chesterton is famously linked to a brief and profound response to a question that was posed to him by the Times of London newspaper. They sent this question out to many known writers of the day, and they asked a very simple question for these writers to respond, which they would then publish in the paper. The question was, what is wrong with the world today? To which Chesterton reportedly sent a simple yet impactful reply Dear sirs, I am sincerely yours, G.K. Chesterton. In our text this morning, Psalm 51, David is caught. Caught red-handed. And in this confession that he gives in Psalm 51, he's going to help us see several things about the human condition. The human problem is sin. But not merely sin. It's not a problem of the mind, like the parent might be inclined to think of his child, but of the heart. David is corrupt to the hilt. And he's going to help us see that in our text this morning. The heading of the psalm, It lives right there above verse 1. You can probably see it in your text. If you've got an ESV, it's not the words in black that come ahead of that. That's written by somebody else. 
It's the words that are in all caps, small caps. It gives the context of the psalm, and it's original, as far as we know, to the psalm. It says, to the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. That's helpful because rather than us guessing as to what caused this psalm to be written like we do with some psalms, it tells us right out of the gate the occasion for which this psalm was written. You may remember this story. We went through First and Second Samuel some time ago. Feels like ages now. But it's back in Second Samuel chapter 11 and 12. David, you'll recall, has, he has sent his army off to war. And David, instead of going out to war with his army like a king normally would do, David is at home. And the author of the text draws attention to this because it's going to be the occasion for a lot of problems in David's life. In fact, the downturn of his uh, royal reign happens right here when he sends his army off to the war and he stays home. David is, of course, on the roof and he's just taking a leisurely stroll, stretching his legs, and he sees a woman bathing on her roof just across the way. He inquires as to who this woman is, and he learns that this woman is the wife of Uriah the Hittite, who happens to be one of his soldiers, one of his elite soldiers. David has a, a platoon of, of men that is something like a SEAL Team 6, so to speak, and they are off at war, obviously. They're gone, and this is one of their wives. And so he, knowing that her husband is off to war, takes Bathsheba to be his own wife, and she becomes pregnant. Now, upon learning that she's pregnant while his men are still off at war, he first tries to cover his tracks. And he does so by calling to Uriah on the battlefield and calling him home. And he encourages Uriah, now that you're home and you're having a good time, why don't you go and be with your wife? But of course, a soldier in that day would refuse such an opportunity to be with his wife, but instead stay chaste like the rest of the army would. And so he refused to go back to his home and be with his wife so that David might cover his tracks. So David tries one more time and he gets Uriah drunk to encourage him all the more to go back to his wife. But still not drunk enough, Uriah refuses to go be with his wife. So David sends Uriah back to the battlefield with a note in his hand that he's not to read. He's just to give to the commander. And he tells, the, the note tells the commander that he is to put Uriah in the most dangerous position on the battlefield and at your command withdraw all the forces secretly from Uriah so that he is left there alone in the middle of the battle. So with Uriah then dead, of course, David's tracks, at least he thinks, are covered. So, uh, 2 Samuel 11 ends with David whew, wiping his brow, getting away with it, right? But the next chapter opens in 2 Samuel 12, and God has sent Nathan the prophet to David because God has seen what David has done. So Nathan comes to David and very cleverly tells him this parable of a rich man who had a single or had lots of possessions. He had everything he could possibly ever want. And a regular guy who had only one lamb. And the rich guy who had plenty saw that one little lamb that was the favorite lamb of this single guy, or this singular guy, poor guy, took the lamb and used it for his own. David hears this story and he thinks that it's a real story. It's something that's actually happened. And he says, well, of course, this guy deserves death. Not only does he deserve death, but the, the poor man deserves to be refunded four times what was taken from him. Nathan, you can imagine, smiles at this and pulls back the curtain of the parable and reveals, David, thou art the man. To which David is shocked and appalled. The Lord then goes on through the mouth of Nathan the prophet to issue a punishment to David. And in verse 13 of 2 Samuel chapter 12, David declares, I have sinned against 
the Lord. It's as if at that moment, David's sin is clear in front of his eyes. There's no hiding from it. He can't deny it. God has sent his prophet Nathan to confront him, and there's no getting out of it. I have sinned against the Lord. As punishment, the child that Bathsheba was pregnant with died, and as a result of, uh, as a result of David's sin... But while the child is sick and before death, David goes into this state of mourning and prayer and will refuse to be consoled in hopes that the Lord will actually save the child's life, will not do what he has promised to do. So this psalm that we're reading this morning is a poem, or or perhaps maybe it's even like a prayer, maybe we could think of it, that David writes sometime after Nathan had confronted him, probably during this time of mourning and prayer where he refuses to be comforted. In this psalm, we've got three main sections that we're going to be looking at where David is going to expose this problem of sin and he's going to say what has to be done about it. And then finally, if God not only sees this problem and does what needs to be done about it, then what the result of this is actually going to be. So this, this psalm, if you want to think of it like this, kind of flows like a problem and a, and a solution and then actually a result that happens in the end. First, we see that the problem is revealed here in the first four verses, and the problem is that sin, the, uh, sin against God. Sin against God is the problem, and for it, we need forgiveness Sin against God is the problem, and because of it, we need forgiveness. Look at verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions. And my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. As we go through these first four verses, we're going to analyze, break down, if you will, David's repentance, his confession. It's not, as you'll notice, what passes for confession in today's day and age, or even for an apology. I'm sorry if you were offended. It's not an apology. That is putting the onus on you, the offended party, as the one that is responsible for this problem that we've got between us. That's not what we're going to see here with David. First, I want you to see a a few important things. First is David's posture in this prayer. When David asks for God's mercy... According to his steadfast love, you understand that he has no right to it. He understands that he has no right to it. He stands there as a man condemned, and he's falling on the, at the feet of God, asking for God's mercy. And the implication there is that I understand that I have no right to it. It's going to have to be God, you, who is merciful, who grants it anyway. Mercy means... That God is withholding a punishment that you rightly deserve. It's acknowledging, I have in fact done it. There's no question about it. And there's no question I don't deserve forgiveness. It is going to require, Lord, your mercy. So the first part of his posture in prayer is this falling on the steadfast love, he says, and mercy of God, which he has no right to forgiveness, but he's asking God for it. That's part of his posture. But second, notice that David asks for mercy as someone who knows the covenant love of God. Look at the beginning there of verse 1 where he says, According to your steadfast love. That that word is like a... Steadfast love is even a hard way of translating. It's, It's like a covenant love. A love that never ends. A love that never stops. A love that's inexpressible except that it comes from God. It's a, it's a kind of love only God can give, a covenant kind of love. He says, according to your steadfast love and abundant mercy. 
He is falling not only on the mercy of God, knowing that he has no right to it, but he understands that because he is God's king, the one that God has put on the throne, because God has set his covenant on David, he has made a promise that David's line will never leave the throne. David is falling on that and saying, if for no other reason than your covenant love, would you please forgive me? He's here a once prideful person, who thinks in 2 Samuel chapter 11, I've gotten away with it. I've done this great crime and nobody is ever going to catch me because I am the king. And now he's been confronted by Nathan the prophet and he's now a humbled son who understands if I am to be forgiven, it is only going to be because of the mercy of God and because of His covenant love that He has set on me for no good reason that I can see. You understand, David is falling on God's abundant mercy and His grace, which he understands he doesn't deserve. So that's his posture in his prayer. But then if you look at his plea at the end of verse 1 and all of verse 2, he says, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. He wants his sin blotted out, For him to be washed thoroughly from it, to be cleansed. And the language that he's using there is like clothing that has been dragged through the mud. It's it's caked with mud. There's absolutely no hope. It's the kid that brings his white shirt home to his mom and it's got grass stains and dirt all over it and hoping that mom can get the grass stains out. And she's like, okay, there's no saving this garment David is here realizing you've got to wash me and wash me again and then wash me again and wash me again until there's absolutely no trace of the sin left behind. Frankly, it's kind of admitting to a reality that he feels resigned to that there seems to be absolutely no hope for washing this garment thoroughly enough. How else could it come clean Except, Lord, you're going to have to take it to the washing machine and do it yourself. It's the only way it's going to happen. When you're truly broken by sin, and and I don't mean the kind of sin where you've been caught and you realize, boy, I don't know how I'm going to smooth things over now. I'm talking about the kind of sin where it doesn't matter if anybody else knows it or not. You know it. It's the kind of sin that you just want to be rid of, and you would do anything and everything. You would give your right hand if it meant you could go back and erase it, that it could just disappear. Have you ever been in that situation where you felt caught red-handed, not necessarily by somebody or maybe by somebody, and you felt like, what I wouldn't give if I could just rewind the clocks back to when I thought this was a logical decision, And just erase it. What I wouldn't give to do that. And you know, if if you've really been broken by sin to that extent, there's no length to which you wouldn't go to have yourself rid of it. But that mark of genuine repentance, the mark of a a desire inside a, a Christian who genuinely wants to repent, is that sin brings this sickening feeling to your stomach. A feeling that you can't really describe to other people and you can't necessarily explain why it's there except for conviction of the Holy Spirit. Nobody can make you feel that. Nobody else can guilt you into that kind of feeling. Oh sure, they can correct your behavior. They can make you want to make amends and make things right. But that sickening feeling that happens down in the pit of your stomach, no one else can bring to you, no outside source can bring to you, except God and God alone. That's where David is. As we're going to see in this psalm, and then also in the book of Hebrews, several years from now when we get there, what David is asking for is to have his sin blotted out. It's not something that can be accomplished by works of the law. It's not something you can do physically. How how can I repay? It's not something that can be repaid. It's not something that can be papered over. But this is what he's been brought to. 
So we see David's, finally, penitence in verses 3 and 4. He says, Against you and you only have I sinned. Now that seems odd to us because, don't you know, he also sent someone's husband off to war and killed him. Or had him killed. He had an affair with that guy's wife. And she's pregnant with his child. So it seems odd for him to say, God, against you only have I sinned. We're thinking, what? Not against God only. Against many other people have you sinned. Now, what David is actually honing in here on here is that any kind of sin is ultimately against God. In other words, if God didn't exist, what happened would not be a sin. It would just be a happening between two people, a survival of the fittest kind of scenario. But because God does exist, because there is an objective standard of right and wrong, David is now saying, I have sinned against God, and because I've sinned against God, it makes everything else worse. Ultimately, it is a sin against God. Maybe it would be better translated against you. You above all have I sinned. Later in verse 14, David is going to confess, hey, deliver me from blood guiltiness. And he's admitting that he has killed a guy in this process. He has done this. Blood guiltiness is murder, essentially. And that's what he's admitting to there in verse 14. But David's penitence, his sorrow, his regret is seen in his agreement with God over what the prophet Nathan has said. Look in verse 4. He says, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. He's demonstrating the essence of what confession and repentance of sin actually looks like. In the end, it's an agreement that what God said is true. See, this, this actually serves as a model for how our repentance really does go, how our confession and repentance goes. It is an acknowledgement that God's Word condemns what I have done. It is an acknowledgement I have done that thing. And so, God, your words are true and my actions are false. What I have done is wrong, and it's in defiance of your words. Is contrition then genuine? Does the sin actually break your heart? Are you seeing how God's word and your sin is in contradiction with each other? So are you coming to God, sickened over sin, and agreeing that what His word says is true and what you've done is wrong? You can see this in 1 John Chapter 1, verse 10, John says this, If we say we have not sinned, we make Him, God, a liar, and His Word is not in us. How does your sin make God a liar if you say you haven't sinned? Plain and simply, God has declared what sin is. He's the one that has defined it. That's why David says, it's because of God that I know this is sin. Against you, I have sinned. Against you above all, I have sinned. God has declared what sin is in His Word. And on the cross, He has gone even one step further to declare what your sin is, specifically. He has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. So in the death of Jesus Christ... God has declared, in no uncertain terms, all of your sins and what they are. He has enumerated them. He has put a number on them. So then, to go to God and say, I have not sinned. Or for David even to reply to the prophet Nathan, Nathan that, no, I, have not, I haven't sinned. That makes God a liar. He's already determined what David's sin is. He's determined what your sin is. So confession... And repentance is going before the Lord, sickened over sin, acknowledging your word is in blatant contradiction with my actions, and I agree, I have done these things, and they are sin. So David here admits to his own sin, and it's a model for how we should 
both in his posture, in his plea, and in his penitence. He says, my, five times in those first four verses. This is my iniquity. But then second, we see that the problem is not only sin and that we need to be forgiven. There is a source that goes deeper than just the mere problem of sin. The heart is the source of the problem. The heart is the source of sin, and it needs renewal. The heart is the source of the problem, and it needs renewal. Look at verse 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in the truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. David is seeing that this sin that he has committed is not an anomaly. It's not as the parent pulls the child aside and says, what's wrong with you? What were you thinking? It's not as though David is reflecting on what he's done and going, man, that was a lapse in judgment. That appeared out of a vacuum. No, he's seeing that it was not an anomaly. There is a commentator named Derek Kidner, and he said it absolutely perfectly, so I'm going to quote him. He says, it was in his character, an extreme expression of the warped creature he had always been and of the faulty stock he sprang from. That's what David is saying. I know in sin did my mother conceive me. He's not calling out his mom for how she had him or how he was born or anything like that. But he's saying that he sins because his heart was corrupted from the womb and he inherited that corrupted heart from his mother whose, heart's w- whose heart was corrupted and she inherited it from her mother whose heart was corrupted and on and on and on we go. There is a problem here. I have been bent from the womb. This is an expression of a warped creature that I have always been because I am of faulty stock just like everyone else. We come by sin naturally. We sin because we're sinners. Sin is not a lapse in judgment, though it is that. It's not merely a lapse in judgment. Lapse in judgment would not happen were it not for a warped heart. We come by it naturally. We sin because we're sinners. So what good then, I ask you, would the first four verses of this psalm be alone? If David had received forgiveness for his sin, but his heart remained warped within his chest, what good would his forgiveness be? Well, David clearly knows And it's seen in verse 6 that in spite of his sin-sick heart, God's delight is to teach His children wisdom in the inward being. He calls it the secret heart. God desires to teach us wisdom around that warped heart, creating in us a new character. So in verses 5 and 6 where the psalm is where the psalm turns because it's more than David merely confessing and repenting of sin. He's wanting the very source of his sin to be replaced altogether. So the psalm turns there in 5 and 6 because David is no longer merely just confessing the one sin. He's asking for God to do a complete and total overhaul of his entire nature. I need something totally new. And you'll see that this takes a couple of forms. First, David wants to thoroughly be cleansed from the faintest hint of sin. I want to be cleansed thoroughly from top to bottom from the faintest hint of sin. In verse 7, 
He says he wants to be purged whiter than snow. In verse 9, he wants God's face to be hidden from his sin. And again, he asks for him to blot out all my iniquities. He mentions blotting out his transgressions in verse 1, but it seems like in verse 1 he's just talking about the transgression that he was caught in, the murder and the adultery and whatnot. But now he's not only asking for just that, he's going to the whole thing. Everything, top to bottom, I want all of my iniquities purged. So I want to be cleansed from the faintest hint of sin. But second, you can see that David wants God to remove that inward desire of sin and replace it with all new desires. And what he recognizes is that this is an act of God. This is not something David is capable of doing. You can probably see this in your own life. You encounter sin and you continue to go back to it. And don't you have that moment where you ask, why do I keep going back to the same sins over and over and over again? And the answer is, because that sin thrills your heart. That's why. Why do I go back to this sin? Why do I do this thing or that thing over and over and over again? And the answer is because it thrills your dead heart. So David says in verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. In verse 11, he asks for God's own Holy Spirit not to be taken from him. You remember in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13, that the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward, it says. David is pleading, this is the only thing keeping my heart upright. You cannot remove your spirit from within me. But we see the new desires that he wants to replace the old sinful ones. Look in verse 8. He wants joy and gladness for the broken bones that the Lord has given him in punishment for his sin. He wants to rejoice instead of lamenting over his sin. In verse 12, he wants joy of salvation restored. He wants a spirit that's willing to resist sin upheld within him. When it comes down to it, the sin that we go back to time and time again, you'll notice is a problem of a desire for righteousness. We lack a desire for righteousness and we desire sin itself. The reason that we pursue it is because it thrills us, because it brings us joy. So what David is recognizing here is I actually need a competing joy. uh, So often in in counseling, uh, people will come in with habits, uh, things that they continually turn back to, sins that they go to uh, all the time. And the process of biblical counseling to help someone see not only their sin, but actually live a life of repentance The first thing, obviously, is we have to put up roadblocks to keep us from getting to the sin, right? That's normal. Everyone would think of that. But the problem, if you merely put up roadblocks to sin, is that if you put the roadblocks up, you also can take them down. turns out there is no obstacle that you can't overcome in your quest for sin. The reason is because we are joy seekers. And we will find the thing that we think will make us the most happy. So our hearts will climb over every obstacle we could possibly put up in the pathway between us and sin. The key to living a life of repentance is not only keeping the obstacles up so that we're reminded time and again, you're going to have to take that obstacle down in order to get sin. But it's actually to replace The joy that sin brings with a competing joy, a greater joy, a surpassing joy. It is for the Christian to find pleasure in the Lord Himself. To find pleasure in His Word. So the defeat of pornography is not merely a block on the internet, on your computer. It is certainly that. It might be getting rid of all devices altogether. But that's insufficient. 
More than that, what's required is you to develop a love for God and a love for His Word. Because if this isn't being developed, my heart will find every reason to climb over those obstacles and get to whatever it is is calling me on the other side. This problem that David is longing for, and he recognizes that I've got, a, I've got a problem deep in here. It's a heart problem. It's not an action problem. It's not a decision problem. It is a heart problem deep down. He is longing for the promises of the new covenant. In the Old Testament, this is exactly what God is promising to His people is coming in the New Covenant, which is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And everything in the Bible, from the earliest parts of the Old Testament, in the Law, in Deuteronomy, in Moses, all the way through the prophets, recognizes that this is a problem, the heart, and it's got to be fixed only by God. And it's a promise that's coming in the New Covenant. You can see it in Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. Moses tells the people of Israel as they're getting ready to go into the promised land, you, you shouldn't sin against the Lord. You shouldn't sin against the Lord, but you're going to. And he tells them this in Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. The Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. There's a problem and it's heart level and God is going to have to circumcise your heart in order for you to live. And then Jeremiah 31, verse 33, comes in later on, which is also quoted in Hebrews 8, 10, and 10, 16. And it says this, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. The promise that was made by Moses, as early as Deuteronomy, is now seen as fulfilled in the promise that Jeremiah is pointing to. It's coming. The new covenant is coming. And it comes in Christ. You see, Christianity is not, first and foremost, a set of laws that must be obeyed. Islam has five pillars that are laws that you must obey in order to be a good Muslim. Judaism has 613 commandments in the Torah that you must follow. It determines how you repent. Hinduism has various duties that they call dharma. Rituals, codes for ethical living. Buddhism has the noble eightfold path, right understanding, right intent, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindlessness, and right concentration. And that leads you to nirvana. Sikhism has three pillars. Meditation on God's name, earnest and on, earning an honest living, sharing with others, and five K's, which are its articles of faith that you must believe. All of those things are laws. They say, do this and you will live. Do this and you will be blessed by God. But Christianity is not first and foremost a set of laws that must be obeyed. It's first and foremost a recognition that my own heart is the problem and that I lack both the capacity and the desire to truly follow God. What's wrong with the world? Islam says, well, it's not following five pillars. Judaism says 613 commandments. Hinduism says dharma. Buddhism says the noble eightfold path. Sikhism says three pillars. Christianity says, Dear sirs, I am. Unless God cleanses me of sin and gives me a heart through His Holy Spirit, it does not matter if you give me one law or 613 laws. I don't have the capacity or the desire to truly follow God. We're born in a state of total depravity. That means from head to toe, I am depraved. I'm crooked from the womb. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? But Paul comes in in Romans 7, verse 22, and he says, For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? The answer 
Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. But do you understand, Christian, that when you come to Christ broken, sin-sick, confessing the sin that burdens you, that lies on your heart, do you realize that when you bring your sin to the foot of the cross of Christ, you are like David, but in a better way, leaning on God's covenant with you? That He is established in the new covenant of the blood of Jesus Christ. So much so that 1 John 1, 9, the verse that comes just before the one that we read earlier, says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So here's the beauty of what God has done in the Gospel. He has identified what our problem is. Your heart is the problem. It's the core of the problem. And it condemns you. But He's offered us salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. And He said, confess your sins. Trust in Jesus Christ. And I'm faithful and just. And I'll forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What David was praying for is true only in the cross of Christ. It's only in the blood of the new covenant. Now, some hear that. Some hear that promise. And with the eyes of faith, they can see what their sin is. And to their very core, it makes them sick. And they hear the offer of salvation and forgiveness in Jesus Christ. And immediately they turn, asking for forgiveness. And you know what? In Jesus, they find it. Others will hear that. Hear the grace offered in the cross of Christ. And will turn and walk away. And instead of receiving the grace that's offered, their own hearts will continue to condemn them. They cannot possibly imagine that what Christ has for them in living righteously could be better and the joy that I've got in these host of other sins that are offered to me. See, what David longed for is now offered to you. It's sitting on the table in front of you. So if today, like David, you see your sin like he did, and in the pit of your stomach it makes you sick like it did David, then you only have to confess it to Christ and trust in the forgiveness that He offers you in His cross and His cross alone. You don't have to come to me. When this service is over, we're not going to have an invitation. And there's a reason for that. There is one intercessor between God and man, and it is Jesus Christ, not me. You don't have to walk this aisle and tell me a thing. I am not the key to your salvation. Jesus is. The only thing you need to do is confess your sin to the Lord and trust Him for salvation. What follows that is a lifetime of repentance of sin, a lifetime of faith, a lifetime of church membership for those who are in Christ. And for that, we can talk. But you don't need to come to me and ask me if you can be a Christian. I'm telling you right now you can be. Confess your sin to Him and trust in Him as Lord and Savior. The heart is the source of the problem. It needs renewal. And only Jesus can provide that renewal. But what's the result of the renewal? You can see this in the verses at the end of this psalm, starting in verse 13. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. 
O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. So what he's saying is following the renewal of the heart, there comes a whole host of things that come out of the person whose heart, whose life is renewed, such as teaching transgressors your ways such as teaching sinners to return to the Lord, telling them how they must find bread, as one beggar tells another. In verse 14, he says, what comes after the renewal of the heart is the singing aloud of righteousness. In verse 15, the declaration of praise. You see, in congregations all over the world, Sunday after Sunday, many Christians will pack pews. Many people, some who are not Christians, some think they are. And they think that what God really is wanting from them is to get up on Sunday and go to church. And if I can just do that and put my rear end in a pew, then God will look upon me favorably. But you see what David is saying here? He doesn't want your bull. He doesn't want your goat. And he doesn't want your rear end. It's your heart. That's the problem. You think that you can make God happy simply by sitting in the pew, but what you don't realize is that it's Christ and Christ alone through Him that God is happy with you. Out of the brokenness and contrition of your heart, Being sin sick. Realizing that the only forgiveness that I have is in the cross of Christ. And the only hope that I have of salvation is in an inward renewal. Only through that is salvation available. I can't put God in my debt. But after that, after the inward renewal... After salvation comes, what is the result? Oh, it's a lot of packing the pews. Oh, it's a lot of singing praises to the Lord. Why? The the songs that we're singing are not songs of obligation. They're songs of praise. They're songs of exaltation. They're songs that because we're reminded of what God has done for us in Christ. Therefore, we're bringing our praises to the Lord. Because He alone is worthy. So the question then is, what is wrong with you? It's your heart. Your sin is not a problem with your thinking. Your sin is a corruption that lies deep within from the womb. What's standing between you and the Lord today? Confess your sin. His word promises that He's faithful and just and will forgive you of your sin and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. But Christian, if you sit there today having confessed your sin and now are wallowing in self-pity, I would push against you and say that also is a failure to trust in the grace and mercy of God through Jesus Christ. You're not going to outrun His grace. You're not going to outrun His mercy. Confess your sin. Bring it to the cross. And then trust that because of Jesus' perfect sacrifice, you are forgiven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for Your Word. We're grateful for what we are reminded of in it. We're grateful for what David tells us in the psalm and reiterates to us again of what repentance actually looks like, what it feels like. We have, so many of us, I'm sure, reminded exactly what that feels like.
to be caught red-handed, to feel that conviction in the pit of our stomach. I pray for those in the room that are dealing with that sickening feeling of sin. They would trust in you for forgiveness. I pray for those Christians who are wallowing in self-pity that you would give them the assurance of what the cross has actually done. Giving them forgiveness only by the blood of Jesus. Cleansing them with hyssop. I pray that we would learn to trust it all the more and rejoice in what Christ has given to us. I pray this in his name. Amen.